This is Beck. He's my best friend from residency. He's about to be intubated for the fourth, maybe fifth time. We've lost track. It took us a while, but now we've perfected it. Elective awake, nasal, fiber optic intubation. No alcohol, no drugs. We sprayed some cetacaine. It's a lot less noxious than lidocaine. It's also banana flavored. We then sprayed some lidocaine with epi, but really Afrin would do because lidocaine doesn't take away that eye-watering, punched-in-the-nose sensation. Unfortunately, nothing really does. We put some lidocaine cream on a tongue depressor and held that on the back of our tongues. It melts, tastes disgusting, but numbs up the oral pharynx. This is a lubed up 32 French nasal pharyngeal airway. Its outer diameter is slightly larger than a 6-0 endotracheal tube, which is what we will ultimately be using. It's a lot softer than an endotracheal tube and when advanced extremely slowly is well tolerated and usually doesn't lead to nosebleeds. However, I can speak from personal experience that rushing this step is very unpleasant and will lead to a nosebleed. You might even want to start with a smaller nasal pharyngeal airway and progressively dilate your way up. Now, there are many different ways to do this next step. We've tried them all, but we like this one the most. I put the endotracheal tube slightly in the nose. I advance a scope into the nose next, finding the largest passage so the endotracheal tube, which comes after, will be less traumatic and irritating. Lightly taping the endotracheal tube to the top of the scope is another option, especially if you don't have an extra set of hands to hold the endotracheal tube. Thanks, Beck. Before I advance the endotracheal tube, I finish the topicalization, which involves spraying 2% lidocaine above and below the vocal cords. We found this to be most effective because the epiglottis is surprisingly good as shielding the vocal cords and the airways from lidocaine. It's easier to access the cords with a scope from a nasal approach than an oral approach. The patient can't bite the scope and there is less gagging. However, it's harder to place a tube through the nose than the mouth. There is simply less space. Doing it in this order means that even if later you can't successfully place the tube through the nose, You've already topicalized the vocal cords and the airways, seen the anatomy, and are therefore even more ready for a fiber optic oral intubation as plan B. What about nebulized lidocaine, you ask? We tried that too, but neither Beck nor I found this effective. Our lips and the tips of our nose were numb, but it didn't blunt gag or cough reflexes like this did. Now is the time to advance the endotracheal tube. I keep the scope away from his epiglottis and vocal cords until the endotracheal tube is through his nose and in his oral pharynx. To be honest, this is a rate limiting step. No point irritating anything if I can't fit the tube through the nose. Sitting back upright and letting him guide the tube was helpful. It is so important to go slow with this step, else your eyes water and you feel like you're being repetitively punched in the nose.
I pull my scope back when I think the tip of the endotracheal tube is in the oral pharynx. And there it is. Now, using all of your video gaming skills, slowly go through the cords without touching anything. Don't do it fast. You can't charge your way through. You have to sneak your way through. Putting the scope deeper minimizes the risk of dislodgement, but increases the risk of triggering coughing. So it depends on your patient, whether you're going to use restraints, and whether you're going to use sedation. For Beck, I'm prioritizing comfort, so I'm purposefully leaving the scope shallow. But for a real patient, I'd probably restrain and at this point sedate a little deeper before leaving the scope deeper and advancing the endotracheal tube. Passing the tube through the vocal cords can be very uncomfortable for some people. Now we advance the endotracheal tube until we can see it on the screen or until it is hubbed, whichever comes first. We are going very slowly, letting Beck dictate the pace. But for patients, especially if they have received sedatives at this point, I usually advance the tube rather quickly, following up with more sedation after the endotracheal tube is in and inflated. We're almost hugged. And there's the tip of the tube. Now we come out with a scope. Nasal pharyngeal intubations are surprisingly well tolerated. Here is Beck, who is now intubating me while intubated. Thanks for watching this video. Special thanks to our mentor, Evelyn Kim, to our videographer, Susanna, and to my wife, Jessica.